Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to invite the Lord to be here. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to fellowship with you on this, your holy Sabbath day. We ask for your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit, to speak through me the words that you've given, that it might be both receive and bless others. And I pray, Lord, surround this church with the heavenly angels, keep the devil away, and help us, Lord, that we can continue to be guided by your Holy Spirit, that we will walk closely by your side. Bless me now, Lord, as I give the message that you've put on my heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. I can tell you that uh, the devil didn't want me to give this sermon today. He did everything in his power to try to disrupt it. Uh, there were strange things going on with the computer. The PowerPoints is just one thing after another, and I knew that I had to pray to be able to complete the sermon. And you're going to hear why in just a moment the devil was so agitated about me doing this presentation today. Uh, the message is really a study of Revelation 17. Uh, and as you know, today there are some confusing messages on the Internet, on Bible prophecy, both within and without our own denomination, so I pray that this study is going to clear up some of the confusion that's even within Adventism today. We will try and cover all of Revelation 17 today in the time that we have because I believe this chapter is vitally important for us to have a correct understanding of Bible prophecy. Uh, I'm amazed at how many people go on the internet and try to interpret Revelation and they misinterpret it simply because they try to put their own interpretation of prophecy instead of allowing the Bible to interpret itself. We've been given the gift of prophecy, so we should know prophecy, but we need to be faithful Bereans and study and allow the Bible to define itself. So let's look at the scripture text again, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's key there. So verse 20 of our scripture text is key to our understanding that Bible prophecy is of no private interpretation. So this is important because there's a lot of individuals, as I said, that are posting their erroneous private interpretations of Bible prophecy on the internet. It's loaded. And these false interpretations of Bible prophecy are leading many people away from the truth. And the devil really is quite happy with these false and deceptive videos because that's the last thing he wants is for people to learn the truth so that they can avoid being deceived by the beast power of revelation and receive its mark. So we know that the Bible interprets itself. So we do not need to offer up any other interpretation that is different than the one that God already gives us in his holy word. So let's turn... We're going to go through the whole of chapter 17 today. So let's look at the first three verses. Revelation 17, verse 1 through 3. Revelation 17, 1 through 3. And say amen when you have it. Verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine 
of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet covered colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the first thing I want to tell you is that every word that we read is important when you want to have a correct understanding of prophecy. So let's examine some of the clues in these three verses. We see that in chapter 17, John is shown something by one of the angels of the plagues. And we know that for 1260 years, the Roman church ruled the world. And it also persecuted the people of God who were forced into obscurity during this time. And that date was from 538 AD all the way up until 1798. So you can reference this. I'm not going to reference it today because we don't have time, but you can look up these references at that time period in Revelation 11, 2, and 3, and also Revelation 12, 6, and Revelation 13, 4, and 5. These are references that you can verify. So now we see that this persecuting power is drunken with the blood of the martyrs, right? She's already committed fornication with the kings of the earth and the people of the earth have been deceived and made drunk by the wine of her false teachings. And the wine is false doctrine. So in prophecy, we use the day for a year as found in Numbers 14.34 and also in Ezekiel 4.6. We use a day for a year to mark the time of prophecy. And this means that 1260 days is 1260 years period of papal rule in the dark ages. And that timing is really important because we want to rightly interpret the message that this chapter has for us today. So what does John see? Well, he sees a woman which symbolizes a church and she's riding on a savage beast, right? Which represents the world governments and powers used by Satan to persecute God's people. So in the Bible, once again, a true church is a pure woman and a corrupt church is represented by a harlot. And so we want to confirm that. So let's look at Jeremiah 6.2. Notice what it says in Jeremiah 6.2. It says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to what? A comely and delicate woman. So that represents a pure church. Now what I want you to do now is to turn in your Bibles to Revelation 19.2. And let's read that. Because once we read it, it'll confirm the truth in our minds. It's better than just listening. So let's read this. Revelation 19.2. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants, his servants at her hand. So right here we see once again, a true church is a pure woman, and she is the bride of Christ in the Bible. But this woman, though she claims to belong to Jesus, has relations with all the kings and governments of the world for money and for power, okay? Then so, that's why she's called the great whore, because she's a harlot. Now let's look at this. Let's look at another description so that there can be no mistaking who this applies to. So we look at another clue in verse 3 to identify who this church is. It commits blasphemy, and I'm talking about verse 3, uh, of Revelation 17. So we'll see, we have to ask the question, well, what is blasphemy? So let's allow the Bible to explain what blasphemy is, right? Because there's actually two definitions of blasphemy. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to the first definition of John chapter 10, Verse 30 to 33. John 10, verse 30 to 33. 
And you're going to notice here when I read in verse 30, it says, I, and this is Jesus talking, I and my Father are one. Verse 32, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? And verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy and because that thou being a man do what? Makest thyself God. So they consider that blasphemy for any man to claim to be God, but Jesus didn't commit blasphemy because he was God, right? So we see here in verse three, that blasphemy, then again, is for a man to claim to be God. And Jesus did not commit blasphemy because he is God, but for a mere man to claim this title is considered blasphemy in the Bible. So now, let's look at the second definition of blasphemy. Turn in your Bibles again to Luke 5.21. We're going to give you the second definition of blasphemy. Luke chapter 5, verse 21 and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but who? God alone, right? So according to Scripture, we see that it is a church with a man at the head that claims to be God and also claims to have power to forgive sins, which is also blasphemy. So the Vatican or the papal church fulfills these two scriptures to the letter. But I want you to notice these two quotes just to confirm this. This first quote, notice this, it says, the Pope and God are what? The same. So he has all power in heaven and earth. Pope Pius V quoted in Berkeley chapter Barclay, chapter 27, okay, 218, Cities Petros Britannus. So this was quoted, but look at the second quote. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is what? Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. That's from the Catholic National, July 1895. So are they claiming... The title of God for the Pope, yes or no? Absolutely. They put it in their own words there. So there's no, they're telling you this is who the Pope is. So now, the second Bible definition of blasphemy that we read earlier is for a mere man to claim that he has the power to forgive sins. So I want you to now to notice this next statement from the Vatican. It says, this judicial authority will even include the power to what? Forgive sins. This is the Catholic Encyclopedia, page 265. So they're saying they have the power to forgive sins, which is also blasphemy according to the scriptures. Now, friends, there are priests claiming the power to forgive sins in the Catholic confessional. That's a well-known fact worldwide. That's not a secret. Almost everybody that knows that who's familiar with the Catholic Church. So these two blasphemous acts are yet another fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation 17. So now, let us read Revelation 17, 4 to 6, because we want to keep building on this to see that there's no excuse that anybody has to say uh, this papal church was misidentified. So let's look at Revelation 17, and let's look at verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in what? Purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound good to me, right? Verse 6, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. 
So once again, this is another description identifying who this harlot power is again. So here's more clues. This is a clear description of the Roman church. Do you see her colors there? What colors are you looking at? You're looking at purple and scarlet, are you not? And look at her riches and jewels. She has a golden cup in her hand full of false doctrines, which make people spiritually drunk when they believe them. And so she's a mother church, right? This is exactly what the Roman power claims to be in her own words. So the Protestant churches she claims are her daughters, and she is indeed drunken with the blood of the saints and martyrs for Jesus because she has persecuted and she has killed God's people by the millions. And it's estimated well over 100 million people were killed by the papal church in the Dark Ages. And an article that I read said the 100 million deaths they believe is a low estimate because many of the deaths were never recorded and they were soon forgotten. And Jesus never wants to use his church to force or obey uh, earthly governments or courts or to make people obey her wishes, right? So that's why when John saw the scene, he was amazed at the sight. So let's turn in our Bibles now to Revelation 17, and let's read verse 7. Revelation 17, 7, it says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now listen carefully. We're going to look at this beast in closer detail in a moment. But the angel here proceeds to give John an explanation, a detailed explanation of the strange scene that he's looking at. So let's now read verse 8. Verse 8. The beast that thou sawest, listen carefully, was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. So, this verse is especially important to us as these things are happening in our world right now before our very eyes. You notice the words, the beast was and is not and yet is. So it ruled during the 1260 years of papal persecution, but now at the time the vision is shown to John, he's told is not, but it'll come back and then ascend out of the bottomless pit. So the expression bottomless pit really means out of the depths of wickedness of sin in this world. So also, if you want to look at the words, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, then you're going to realize that it's talking about the same beast power, the same entity that was mentioned in Revelation 13.3, where it says, if you remember, and all the world wondered after the beast. It's the same power. So now we see that this beast, when it comes back again, it's going to arise out of the bottom of this pit. So as wicked and cruel as it was before the Dark Ages or during the Dark Ages, the 1260 years, it'll be worse and in a slightly different form when it comes back again. So let's read that. Let's now read Revelation 17, 9. Verse 9, it says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So it's giving us another description, another clue here. So Rome is always or often referred to as the city on seven hills or seven mountains. So the city of Rome was built on seven literal mountains. And I want you to notice this statement here. It is within the city of Rome called the city on seven hills that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confirmed. That's directly from the Catholic Encyclopedia there, end quote. So there's also another meaning that should be noted here. And in prophecy, a mountain also refers to a church or a religious power. So the number seven means complete or total. So this religious power it sits on or it influences and tries to control 
all religious organizations. And now I know that there are some skeptics out there right now who are, will try to downplay this and they're going to say, oh, the papacy is not that powerful or influential anymore. You know, they, they're never going to try to persecute other Christians. They've changed. They're, they're different. And they're going to say that they're not the same persecuting church as the Dark Ages. I could hear them right now. But some even claim that the papacy would never ever try to bring in a one world religion or force worship. And that's just, that's just Adventist dogma. That's what they're going to say, right? Well, I want to play a short video clip because seeing is believing. And there are others that are not of our faith that are beginning to see the writing on the wall. Because there are other people that are also reading their Bibles, friends, not just SDAs. So I want you to watch and listen closely. It's only a couple minutes long, but this is a person that's not of our faith. Listen to what he has to say. All right, I thought this was extremely telling here. Um, as far as people would say that uh, the Vatican is not in control. The Vatican is just, they're powerless, they're weak, whatever else. I'm just going to play this video. We're not going to listen to the sound. Uh, this is just, uh, what was this? Uh, let's see here, March 24th. Three days ago, all the heads of uh, the European Union, there you see Merkel, you know, Chancellor of Germany, all these big, you know, politicians, heads of state and things like this in Europe. And the Pope just says, hey, you know, show up for a meeting. They all, yes, sir, you know, they're all going to get over there. Um, what other religious leader has this kind of power? Not to mention what kind of a political leader has this kind of power. That he just, hey, come on over. I want you over here. Report for duty. I mean, it's it's crazy. But still you have these people and they just insist that America is Mystery Babylon or some kind of foolish nonsense. I mean, you know, it's crazy. Just kind of zip ahead here. Doesn't matter. You can watch the video if you really want to, if you really feel led to it. But, you know, posing for the pictures there, you know. The Pope, in his white suit with everybody else dressed in black, the occult significance of it, you have the purple and the scarlet, mentioned in Revelation chapter 17, it's right there, I mean, <laughs> come on people, you know, but uh, if you're not convinced by now that, that uh, Roman Catholicism is mystery Babylon of Revelation 17 and 18, well, I can't help you. So you see exactly what this man is pointing out. It's not just us as SDAs that are waking up or that understand who Mystery Babylon is. There are Protestants that are waking up. Can you name another church on this planet that can beckon all the world leaders to come and meet with their leader and they immediately obey? Can you name another leader that can do that, another church leader? You just, you, you can't do it, friends. The Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy will be fulfilled to the very letter, whether we believe it or not. Now, let's read now Revelation 17, 10. Let's read verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So I want you to remember those words. So these heads and seven kings are one and the same, friends. It's not two different people. It's not two different entities. So who are these seven kings? Well, let's take a look. They represent all the powers that Satan has used to fight against God and his truth and his faithful people throughout history. So here they are in prophetic order. Number one, Babylon, 605 to 539 B.C. Number two, Medo-Persia, 539 to 331 B.C. Number three, Greece, 331 to 168 B.C. Number four, Pagan Rome, 168 to 476 A.D. And number five, Papal Rome, 538 to 1798. And this being the head that was wounded in 1798. So these are the five fallen kings, right? So now, there are five kingdoms that are fallen, 
And then it says one is, this is the lamb-like beast or USA with its two horns of civil and religious liberty. So how do we know this for sure? Well, you're going to remember that in Revelation 13, 12, it tells us that it exercises all the power of the leopard-like beast before it. So we know that the two-horned beast representing the USA follows the leopard-like papal beast or head. And in this prophecy, the papal head is not yet wounded, but it's about to fall, though it still reigned. So it was past its power and glory. But now notice it says one has not yet come. And this is, as we will see, is what we're now hearing a lot about in our world today. The New World Order. So this is actually a coordinated United Nations Club of Rome activity, and it is backed up by the might of the USA and the papal power. But when it comes into power, it'll be using its moral authority through the resurrected papal Roman head. Okay, so let's read verse 11, Revelation 17, 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So we're seeing here that when the Roman power's deadly wound is healed, it can once again persecute heretics, or who they deem as heretics, right? It was one of the seven, but now here it comes back again. So the Vatican was a power from 538 to 1798, and it's not a power from 1798 to 1929, and then yet it's a power since 1929, if you remember from verse 8. So we're told that it shall go into perdition. And in other words, it'll continue until the end of all things. And then it'll be destroyed by the plagues and the brightness of Christ's coming with the wicked, right? So let's read now verse 12 and 13. Notice it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received, notice these words, no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their strength at their power and strength unto the beast. So most people today don't realize this fact that on April of 1968, the leaders of 10 different countries, they gathered together in Rome to seek solutions for world prosperity and world peace. So the Club of Rome was charged with the task of overseeing the um, regionalization and unification of the entire world. So if we are truly students of Bible prophecy, we don't need to guess who's actually in control of the Club of Rome, do we? We already know that. So the club's finding and recommendations, they were published in confidential reports and are sent to all the global elite to be implemented. So on September the 17th, 1973, the Club of Rome actually released a report and it was called the Regionalized and Adaptive of the Global World System. And this document revealed that the club, they divided the world into 10 political and economic regions, which they referred to as kingdoms. So let's look at the 10 kingdoms here. Number one was Mexico, United States, and Canada. Do you hear people yelling and screaming about open borders right now? How many people realize that the papal church was talking about opening up the borders many, many years ago? There was a gentleman uh, on a video that uh, Pastor Jan had, and he worked for the government, and he was doing some evangelism, and he came to this place, and they invited him in, in this house, and there was all these heads, these pap uh, big Catholic bigs, bigwigs there, and they invited him to join them, and they told him, and he started asking them questions, and they said, well, how are you going to control the United States? And they told him, we're going to open up the borders. And he says, we're going to take all these people in from Mexico, and we're going to see the South. Do we have open borders right now, yes or no? So what these men, that was nearly... 60, 70 years ago that they told him that. So now, that's why they want to open up the borders, friend, because they're planning for this new world order, so to speak. So let's look at number two. Number two is the European Union, Western Europe, right? 
Number three is Japan. Number four is Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Israel, and Pacific Islands. Number five is Eastern Europe. Number six, Latin America, Central and South America. Number seven is North Africa and the Middle East, including the Muslims. Number eight, Central Africa. Number nine, South and Southeast Asia, right there. And number 10, Central Asia. So the leaders, they designated these 10 regions to agree to let this beast power rule as this is the way they can best get the people under control by using a religious power. So again, most people don't know this fact that on June 26 of 2000, they signed a declaration to declare that the Pope is now the global moral authority to how many Christian denominations? All Christian denominations on earth. Most people aren't even aware of that. And that was, that was a signed declaration. So the last pope has led the world to believe that Rome is just a good and moral power that wants to help society for the common good. And so they agreed to give their kingdom to the beast. And sadly, most people, most Protestants, have forgotten how Rome used such power in the past when she had it, and that it is Rome's boast that she never changes. They're the ones that say, Rome says she never changes, even though the Protestants say she, she has. So this is their boast. And the papacy supposedly gives the UN their moral authority and a third player, the USA, which gives the financial and military power to this final triune government. We really know that Rome also controls the United Nations as well, if you're paying attention. So this is what we call the New World Order, or what I call the New World Disorder, which will lead the world into the seven last plagues up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's read verse 14, Revelation 17. It says, And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So this really is what Armageddon is all about. It's making war with the Lamb. It's the it's a battle of good and evil. So how can an early earthly power, you say, make war with the Lamb? Well, they make war with the Lamb by persecuting his followers. And that's what they will do, and that's what they are doing, and that's what they have done. And Jesus said that what anyone does to any of his children is the same as if it was done to him. So we see here that God knows all about what these powers are planning to do. And he told people about it long centuries before any of it really happened. So we can know that he is in charge. And if we stay obedient to Jesus, then we will be kept safe. And that's a key word, if we stay obedient to Jesus. So now let's look at verses 15 to 17. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall, notice that word, hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fires. So this means there's going to be some animosity going on here. Right, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So the first thing you notice is in verse 15 is that this corrupt church called the whore is the exact same beast that was described in Revelation 13.1 that comes up out of the sea. And it rises up from a densely populated area. Uh, let's turn over to Revelation 13 and let's read that Revelation 13, 1 and 2. And notice what it says here in verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns 
ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And we know that the dragon is Satan. But you can clearly see how the Bible again is interpreting itself. We don't need to guess or look onto the internet at those that are walking in darkness or that are putting their own private interpretation on the scriptures. We have to let the Bible define the Bible. We have been given the gift of prophecy and if we are faithful Bereans, we will not be deceived if we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and if we allow the Bible to define itself. So we have to remember that in prophecy, what? A woman is a church, right? And a beast is a nation. So where in the world do you see a church and a nation joined together as one? There's only one entity on planet Earth that fits this unique description. Only one. It's the Vatican. The Roman Catholic Church, which is the woman, and the nation of the Vatican City, which is the beast. So I want you to notice something interesting in Revelation 17, 16, where it says, These horns agree to let the horde beast power rule, but inside they really hate her, and they can't wait until they can destroy her and rule by themselves. So this is not a mystery, friends, because without Christ, people act just like Satan, right? He wants to destroy everybody and rule everybody and everything. But notice that the ten horns mentioned here, they're not the same ten horns on the terrible beast of Daniel 7. That, that's key. Because those ten horns were the divided up Roman Empire and it represented the nations of Europe. But these horns are the exact same horns as the ten toes in Daniel 2. You all remember the image of Nebuchadnezzar, right? Let, let's turn to Daniel 2 and let's read that. 33 to 35. You say amen you have that. Verse 33, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and become like chaff, like chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So we know as students of Bible prophecy that the stone that was cut out without hands had hit the feet of the image and it break it in pieces, it represents the kingdom of Jesus Christ that's going to last forever. And I want you to notice how Daniel explains this again in Daniel 2, verses 42 to 44. Daniel 2, verses 42 to 44, and verse 42, it says, that, As the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So we see that the, the stone is going to hit the toes. We're living in the toes right now, friends. And as we see that, that the ten toes of the great image in Daniel 2, they're the same as the ten kingdoms of Daniel 17 and just before you know, the return of Jesus Christ to this world. So these horns have no kingdom yet, but they're going to rule with the papal beast for a short time when the two-horned beast speaks like a dragon. So the two-horned beast in prophecy, as we said before, it represents the United States. And in other words, we see again, it's kind of a three-fold union, the same as the beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. And this is the papacy, apostate Protestantism, and really uh, spiritualism. But Babylon the Great is made up of these three parts and is joined together by an agreement 
for one purpose, which is going to be to destroy God's people and to keep and destroy the truth from off the earth because they don't want the truth. They hate the truth. They don't have a love for the truth. Now, these 10 kingdoms are not going to cleave together and they're going to hate the whore and desire to throw off their power. So essentially, these powers will desire to eliminate each other as soon as possible so that they could actually rule by themselves. So now you understand why I call them the New World Disorder. Let's read Revelation 17, 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So here's really another clue as to what this power is. I mean, there's only one city that claims to reign over the kings of the earth, and that is the Roman Vatican, as we saw earlier. There is no other church state power on earth that claims the right to reign over the kings of the earth. Let's look at this. These are quotes that confirm Revelation 17, 18, so it's not just my words. It is the office of the papacy to tread underfoot what? Kings and emperors. That's written in the Pope and the Council of London, page 35. Notice these words below it. See, sir, from this chamber, I govern not only Paris, but to China, not only to China, but to all the world without anyone knowing how I do it. That was the 14th Jesuit general, uh, Tromberini, right? So he says nobody knows how he rules the world, right? Well, let's try to see if we can find out how he's doing it, right? Notice this from Eric John Phelps, the author of Vatican Assassins. The Jesuit general rules the world through his what? Provincials. And the provincials then, of course, rule the lower Jesuits. And there are many Jesuits who are not professed. So many of the lower Jesuits have no idea what's going on at the top. They have no concept of the power of their order. And those words in red, their ultimate goal is what? The rule of the world with the Pope of their making from Solomon's rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. That's from Eric John Phelps. So friends, there can be no mistaking what their goal is and that they already feel that they have control of the, the world. From the abundance of evidence presented today, who the beast power is of Revelation, and that is the woman, as we said before, the apostate church, the mother of harlots that sits on seven mountains, and in verse 18 where it says, reigneth over the kings of the earth. It's none other than the papacy. There's no other church that fits it. There's no other church state power on the planet. Now, I want to say this. There are many good Catholics in the church today that God is actually calling to come out of her, my people. And notice he says, my people. God has good, faithful souls in the Catholic church today. Notice that Revelation 18.4 says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. So God is asking his servants to call these people out of apostasy because it is an apostate system. This is not necessarily a reflection on the members because many of them are living to all the light they had and they're waiting to receive the light that they should come out of apostasy. And many of them have already come out. So he calls them my people because many of them are going to be saved, believe in the kingdom of heaven, while many, even in our own denomination, are not going to make it in. So we have to pray for them and also pray for our own people so that we will all respond to the Holy Spirit. So we want to recap what we've learned today on Revelation 17. We know that since the time of the Reformation, the identity of the whore of Revelation 17 has never been in doubt. The whore of Revelation 17 is the system, not the people, but the system of Roman Catholicism. And we see that some of the characteristics of the horror are as follows. So let's look at that. Number one, it unites with the world leaders and state governments to bring the church and state together. It is both a church and state power, Revelation 17, 2, right? And number two, what does it do? It commits blasphemy, as in found in Revelation 17, 3. It is a very wealthy, uh, they, someone I wrote 
I read that had written that the Catholic Church is richer than several countries put together. That's how much wealth they have. Okay, it is, it's priests and bishops dress in purple and scarlet, which you saw, right? Revelation 17, 4. It has killed millions of Christ followers, Revelation 17, 6. It is located on seven hills slash mountains, Revelation 17, 9. It rules over and claims authority over kings and rulers. And you just read from its own mouth what it claims to rule over all the world, right? So all the reformers and honest students of Bible prophecy, you can only come to one obvious conclusion that the whore of Revelation 17 is indeed the papacy. And friends, you know, the outcome of the final battle of Revelation 17, 14 is really not in doubt. The Lamb is going to overcome the papacy, the governments of the world that are part of the new world disorder, and all of the forces that have joined Satan in his rebellion and his war against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, they will be defeated. The only question that we have to ask today is whose side will we be on when the door of probation is finally closed and the seven last plagues begin to fall? Will we be in the fold? Will we be under the protection of Christ? There's many people today that are going to reject the truth. They don't want the truth. They don't have a love for it. So they're going to ridicule us. They're going to persecute us. They're going to laugh at us, scoff at us, call us all kinds of names. You're conspiracy theorists. You're fanatics. You're a cult. You're this or that. You can't expect that they're going to be accepting what you have to say if they're walking on the broad road because light has no fellowship with darkness so the majority of the world is wrong they're all always wrong if you look at the bible from genesis to revelation the majority of people in every single bible story were always on the wrong side nothing has changed nothing will change the majority will be going on the broad road but there is a minority that's going to stand for the truth in the face of ridicule scoff persecution hatred, they're still going to stand stiffly for the truth. And I pray that we all will be among that group. And I want to close with this text from Revelation 15, 2 and 3. Please turn with me there and let's read this. Revelation 15, verse 2 and 3. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And I truly believe that if we are the 144,000 are never going to win any kind of popularity contest. They will be hated and despised. But if we are faithful as part of the 144,000, God will give us a crown that will never fade away. Amen? Uh, let us bow and close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the special gift of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy that you've given to us so that we know the times that we're living in today, the door of probation is almost closed. We have very, very little time to get ready. We must be ready if we are going to make it into the kingdom of God so that we can reunite with the saints on the sea of glass. I pray for each and every one of us here. Continue to be with us. Continue to guide us and keep us strong in the face of persecution. Let us not waver in our faith. Let us allow the Holy Spirit to rule and control our lives, that we will be accounted faithful when you come to take your faithful church home with you. I ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen.